Family Theatre presents Sally Forrest and Walter Brennan. From Hollywood, the Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theatre, brings you Walter Brennan in The Luck of Roaring Camp. To introduce the transcribed drama, here is your hostess, Sally Forrest. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Before we launch into Bret Hart's famous classic, a word about family theater. Family theater is on the air each week with a reminder of that inexhaustible source of blessings, family prayer, encouraging all of us to pray for peace in our time, peace in our world. And now swiftly to the luck of Roaring Camp, Starring Walter Brennan as Stumpy. I remember that Saturday night in June 1850 very well. It was just last year. And as I strolled into Tuttle's Grocery, the saloon, I found it deserted. Well, for Saturday night, mind you, this was most unusual. And since I'm always minded for a little game of chance, I'm John Oakhurst, the gambler, I left Tuttle's to learn what had happened to the citizens. I found just about the whole camp, some hundred men, grouped before a rude cabin on the outer edge of a cliff. It was the home of the one woman in Roaring Camp, Cherokee Sal. Trouble always comes of having a woman in camp. I always was again it. That's enough out of you, Kentuck. Things is rough enough on Sal as it is. You think she'll get through safe enough? Uh, she ain't the first woman to have a baby, Sandy, and likely not to be the last. <laughs> I guess you're right. Uh, anyone care to make a bet on the sex of the child? Uh, oh, cursed. Um, <laughs> what are your odds, gambler? I'll lay you one to four, it's a girl. Blonde or brunette? <laughs> <laughs> I'll lay you one to six, it's a redhead. <laughs> not me. You can't beat the gambler no matter what odds he gives you. Tails he wins, heads you <laughs> Hey, see, maybe we ought to send over to Sandy Hook for Sal's husband. Him? Probably hung by now. Well, would you like to bet on that? No. Any man who don't stand by when his wife's gonna have a baby ought to be hung. Maybe we ought to hang him. We could ride over that way tonight, string him up before morning. Hey, all right, all right. <laughs> well, I'll be... A baby. A real baby. The first one to be born in Roaring Camp. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's celebrate! Yeah! Cut out your ruckus, boys. Huh? Huh? Shell's dead. Get, oh, huh? that's too bad. Oh, about the kid. Really? What about the kid? You don't know whether we can save him or not. He, he needs food. Bad. Huh? Food? Well, there's plenty of that. Oh, we can rustle him up a steak and maybe a little whiskey might perk him up, sir. He needs milk. Milk? Where are we going to get milk in Roaring Camp? Yeah. Well, you say, Kentuck, what about that female jackass you got? My Jenny? The same. Well, now, she did have a young one just recent. Ooh, Romulus and Remus were suckled by a wolf. Who? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> That's a cry for help if I ever heard one. See what you can do with Ginny, boys, while I keep an eye on the kid. And hurry. Oh, All right, let's go. Jenny was most obliging, and it wasn't long before Cherokee Sal's infant was fed and sleeping peacefully in a candle box which Stumpy had fixed up with red flour. It was about 3.30 in the morning now. Sal lay still and quiet under a blanket on a bunk. But the boys clamored to see the newest arrival in camp. So Stumpy, with new dignity, set the candle box on the pine table and his hat beside it, brim up. Boys, uh, you'll pass in at the front door, around the table, and out the back door. Them as wishes to contribute anything to the orphan will find my hat handy. Well, seeing as it's your hat, Stumpy, how do we know the orphan will get the contribution? If I'm going to steal Kentuck, I'll steal from a grown man and not a baby. File in, boys. Take a good look and pay well for the look. Hey, is that him? <laughs> He's a mighty small specimen. Never saw one so lately come. Ain't he wrinkled for such a young thing? Ain't much bigger than a derringer. Not half so handy. Hey, what you expect, Kentuck? 
Maybe you was a figuring on putting him to work on your claim right away. Huh? <laughs> uh, now, look, uh, you went and woke him up. Uh, why, oh, why, that, uh, that darn uh, little cuss. He's a wrestling with my finger. Look at that. Kentucky's actually blushing. Oh, blush? Me? <laughs> hey, that's enough, boys. If you're all through looking and contributing, why, just go along quiet now. All except you, Kentucky. Me? Well, why can't I go along, too? I've seen him enough. Well, as so long as you're so darned worried about who's going to get the contributions, you just stay here and count them with me, just to make sure everything's square and legal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't he go to sleep? He ain't bothering you, Nunzi. See, we already counted up uh, some $200 in loose change. Now, let's see what we got here in the way of loot. Well, looky here. Silver tobacco box. Silver? And, and what's this? A Spanish doubloon. Pure gold. <laughs> and this is a Navy revolver. Well. Now, don't get go to getting itchy fingers. Oh, who's getting itchy? You wanted me to count, didn't you? Yeah, as long as you let it stay counting. Now, here's a gold nugget. Gee, it's a good big one. Look, that'll buy the kid vittles for a spell. Yeah, and it can buy some grain for Ginny. As long as he's drinking the milk of my jackass, you can darn well pay for some of the feed. Yeah, and as long as Ginny don't mind, can't see what you got to kicking about. What do you know? Look, here. Here's a lady's handkerchief. All embroidered. <laughs> Ooh, sweet smelling. Yeah, that'll be from Oakhurst. He's one gambler who's as lucky at love as he is at cards. Hey, ain't that Sal's diamond brooch? Yeah, yeah, it sells. I put that in the hat first off all. Who's got more right to it than a kid? Did I say no? Yeah, there you are now. Sure now, kid, you're all safe and snug. Here we are, look. Slingshot. And that'll come in handy from when he's a, a mite bigger. Hmm. A Bible. Hmm. Gold spur. Wonder where the other one is. <laughs> Silver teaspoon with some strange initials. And looky here, Kentuck. He's a pair of surgeon shares in a banknote of England. Five pounder. A lot of good that's going to do him. But this will do a heap of good. Your ring, Stumpy. Why, I thought a man would have to cut your hand off to get that ring. A man would, Kentuck. And I'll give it to the kid. You know, when I was in here with Sal, when he was born... I had a feeling like, you know, like I never had before. There was a soul being born right here before my eyes. I aim to take good care of that soul, Kentuck. And Sal's brooch puts me in mind of, of my ring, <laughs> and I just went a two diamonds better. <laughs> next day, we laid Sal to rest on Boot Hill, and then held a meeting to decide the infant's future. Roaring Camp was unanimous in adopting the boy, but there was some difference of opinion as to his raising. Well, now, I tell you, I still say we ought to send the kid away. Roaring Camp ain't no nursery. Right. Well, we could send him to Red Dog until he gets a little meat on him. Oh, Red Dog, that's 40 miles away. Well, sure it is, but it's got females, and he needs females to take care of him, Stumpy. He's being took care of by a female. What about Jenny? Send him to Red Dog. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute now. Shell's young'un stays here in Roaring Camp. Well, I'm all for that. Why, them fellows at Red Dog would swap him and bring in somebody else in us when we wanted him back. Hey, you know you can't trust him. Look, uh, what about sending for a nurse? Nurse? Hmm? You mean a female? Of course. No, siree. What lady'd come to Roaring Camp? She got no more business here than this kid. Oh. Now, listen here, everybody, especially you, Kentuck. Cherokee Shell's kid was born here in Roaring Camp, and he's going to stay here. We can send to Sacramento for, for his necessaries. The best that can be had, too. Lace and filigree and frills and, and darn the cost. That's it, So the baby stayed, and strange to say, thrived mightily. Nature took the fondling... Nature took the foundling to her broad and generous breast, and in the rare atmosphere of our Sierra foothills, pungent with pine, the child found health and vitality. But after a month passed, a new crisis arose, and Stumpy called another meeting. This time, the boy was present, smiling from his rough pine box. 
Well, what do you call us here first, Stumpy? Want some more contributions? No, I don't want no more contributions, Kentuck. <laughs> then what is it you do want, old-timer? This young'un's got to have a proper name. Uh, what do you say, uh, oh, Chris? You got education. Uh, uh, what do you say we call the sales baby? Yeah, well, well uh, the child has brought plenty of luck to Roaring Camp, hasn't he? Oh, well, I'll say he has. We've took more gold out of the gulch since he came in the whole year before. See, that's right. We're in bonanza times. Then what do you say? We christen him... Do what to him? Uh, name him, Stumpy. Uh, what do you say we call him Luck? Luck? Luck. Well, everybody should have a proper name, as Stumpy said. In the boy's case, it's better to take a fresh deal all around. Call him Luck and start him fair. Luck? Say, that is a good <laughs> name. Well, we'll do this here christening up brown, huh? Have music, a parade, a real ruckus, huh? Yes, sir. As long as you're sent on letting him stay, might as well make it worthwhile. Let Roaring Camp live up to its name. Right. That's it, we'll roll. Say, uh, you bring plenty of liquor along to celebrate, won't you, Kentuck? I'll load Jenny up with liquid refreshment. <laughs> <laughs> there won't be such a wing ding since Frisco Pete shot can act a joke. <laughs> yeah, and we'll sing for the kid, too, boys. Mighty sweet. Uh, once we wet our whistle. <laughs> yeah, you bet we will. There's a fine place for singing under the shade trees by the clearing. I'll stake Jenny out there and unlimber them refreshments that I spoke of. <laughs> An orchestra can sit there, too. Not so fast, Andy. Not so fast, and you too, Kentuck. What about me? There'll be no liquor served at the Lux Christening. Oh, 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 man, have you gone crazy? No, it ain't my style to spoil your fun, boys, but it strikes me this ain't exactly on the square. What are you talking about? It's a fair and square christening, ain't it? <laughs> That's right, it is. And I'm his godfather. And you ought to know best it ain't right to ring in fun on this little fella, and he ain't gonna understand it. And if there's gonna be any godfathers running around here loose, I'd like to see anybody who's got a better right than me. Jenny. <laughs> so Tommy Luck was duly christened. And from that time on, a strange thing began to happen in Roaring Camp. You might say a sort of regeneration. Naturally, the cabin of the Luck, the baby, gave the first evidence of this miracle of improvement. Come on now. Yeah, I move with that scrubbing, boys. New Sandy. Mix up some more whitewash, will you? My bucket's about empty. Oh, coming right up, Stumpy. Oh, doggone it, Stumpy. I ain't never worked so hard, not even on my gold claim. Yeah, you only just begun to work, Kentuck. After this cabin's all cleaned and whitewashed, it's gonna get wallpapered. Wallpapered? And we're gonna make new furniture, too. Now, what's the matter with the furniture you got? Ain't luck rosewood cradle enough? Packing it in 80 miles by mule. <laughs> Never heard of such a thing. Well, yeah, that's the trouble. That cradle sort of kills the rest of the furniture. We gotta live up to that rosewood cradle. Yeah, well, you live up to it. I'm getting the whole thing. Why, Tuttle's groceries, even putting new mirrors and carpets in. It's a disgrace. Carpets in a saloon. Well, let me tell you, even with the carpets, Tuttle's can't, can't buck our competition. What competition? I don't see you handing out any free drinks. Don't have to. The boys would rather come here and play with the luck than sit around playing cards and drinking whiskey, which reminds me, Kentuck. Reminds you what? From now on, anyone who holds the luck or even comes into this here cabin has got to be washed and wearing a clean shirt. Oh, now, now, Stumpy, that's a going too far. It's the law. You want to come near luck, you got to come clean. Well, who said I wanted to come near him? I, uh, I, uh, yeah, well, it's, uh, it's going to be an awful strain, but... Uh, I'll think it over. And Ken Doug did think it over. And though he grumbled plenty, he appeared at Luck's cabin every afternoon after working his claim, clean and sparkling and uh, wearing a fresh shirt. But that wasn't the only drastic change to come over Roaring Camp. You want to wake up the luck? This is nap time. Are you doubting my honesty? I'm saying you dealt from the bottom of the deck, Gambler. Then go for your gun. Reach for the... Stumpy, keep out of this. It's an affair of honor. Honor be hanged. I won't have the luck scared out in his wits. If you so set on killing each other, why use knives? But there be no shooting. Yes, 
Yes, Roaring Camp was considerably changed. It was a long, golden summer. Tommy Luck was usually carried to the gulch that supplied most of the camp's gold and placed on a blanket over pine boughs. He lay there as the men worked in the ditches below. And after a while, they got to decorating his bower with wild honeysuckle, azaleas, and the painted blossoms of Las Mariposas. Yes, for the first time, the boys, myself included, were seeing the beauty of small things. Hi there, Luck. How you doing? Hey, hey, looky here, this piece of mica, ain't it pretty? <laughs> That's right, grab it. You got the makings of a miner already. Yeah, well, it's no thanks to you, Sandy. Oh, what's the matter with you, Stumpy? I won't have you giving the luck any fool's gold. Oh, you're loco. He don't know the difference. Yeah, well, he won't learn no younger. If you want him to admire something, why, just fetch him a nugget or gold dust. But don't you fool around with Micah, fool's gold. You might teach him bad habits. <laughs> crept up to the bank just now, and darn my skin if the luck weren't talking to a jaybird as was sitting on his lap. Kentuck, you been sampling spirits again? No, sir, I have not. I'm telling you the honest truth. There they was, just as free and sociable as anything you please, a jawing away at each other just like two cherry bums. <laughs> Kentuck, does you telling me this mean you're just a kind of cottoning to the little feller at last? Me? No, sir. I just thought it was uh, real remarkable. A jaybird that tame. <laughs> yes, for Tommy Luck, the birds sang, the squirrels chattered, and the flowers bloomed. Nature was his nurse and playfellow. For him, she sifted golden shafts of sunlight through the leaves to fall just within his pudgy grasp. To him, the tall redwoods nodded and whispered in friendship. The bumblebees buzzed and the rooks caught a lullaby. And uh, the rooks weren't the only birds to sing the luck to sleep. I now call this here meeting to order. All right, Stumpy, bring the luck up here on the soapbox so as everybody can see him. Solemn little We're coming, Sammy. <laughs> He's <these> big gray eyes. <laughs> now, here we are. Say, how did everyone look? <laughs> <laughs> boys, boys, yeah. Stumpy's got a few words to say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, seeing as how we we all hit such good times in Roaring Camp all summer, and uh, and seeing as how the luck here is growing like a weed, I propose that uh, that we build a hotel here in Roaring. Oh, hotel? Oh, what for? Jackrabbits and sage hens? Yeah. <laughs> no, can talk. We're thinking of inviting one or two decent families into town next spring. Families? Females again? Naturally, they live at the hotel. Luck can't grow up without knowing what a woman looks like. Well, he's a doing a mighty good job of it right now. Let him stay happy while he can. <laughs> Look here now. You're getting them all riled up with such talk, eh? Now, now what, what about me getting riled up? Now, I was in Roaring Camp long before the luck came along. I've put up with him so far, ain't I? Changing shirts and the washing and... Well, that's all right, but when it comes to building hotels and important families and females... I put my foot down. Oh, no, wait a minute. Well, I know it's asking considerable, Kentuck, but we all got to make some sacrifices for the luck's sake. Fears like you could stand some softening female influence, Kentuck. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, I think it would be a welcome change in Roaring Camp. Yeah, you all as was a ladies' man, Oakhurst, donating that embroidered female handkerchief the day that luck was born. Why, such a thing could ruin him for life. <laughs> now, look, we won't build the hotel till spring, Kentuck. Maybe you'll sweeten up on the idea. No, by sir. Then. Not by spring, summer, winter, nor fall. I'll never feel different about females. Not even for the luck? You must learn to accept change, Kentuck. Well, yeah, maybe I can learn plenty, but not from a yearling kid gambler. Sounds like you can learn plenty from the luck. And I see you're all again me. I never thought I'd live to see the day when a squall and brat had come between me and my old partners. Now, Kentuck, you just listen. No, here. you listen. Go on, build your fancy hotel. Import your darn females. Run anything else in here you please for all I care. But Kentuck won't be around to see it. What? Uh, you don't mean you'd 
be leaving Roaring Camp. Yes, I mean just that. The time's come for a showdown, and if you're set on this crazy idea, then I'll pack Ginny and light out. From now on, Roaring Camp ain't big enough to hold me and the luck. <laughs> Jane Duck's bitter ultimatum was the first chill wind to strike the camp, and it brought more misfortune. The winter of 1850 will long be remembered in the foothills. The snow lay deep on the Sierras, and every mountain creek became a river, and every river a lake. Each gorge and gulch was transformed into a tumultuous watercourse that descended the hillsides, tearing down giant trees and scattering drift and debris along the plain. And as the terror drew near Roaring Camp, Hey, Stumpy! Stumpy! Open up! You? You, Kentuck? Yeah, hey, get your clothes on. Uh, uh, what you mean? Coming here at this time of the night? Want to wake up the luck? Oh, hang the luck. You and him got to clear out of here. Since when? The Red Dog's been underwater the second time. News just come in to Warren Roaring Camp. If North Fork jumps the bank, we'll all swim. Well, this is a pleasure to hear. Kentuck worrying about the luck. Hey, listen, Stumpy. Water put the gold in our gulches, and it can darn well take it out again. Kentuck, you've been shooting your mouth off around here considerable about other things. You said you was a, it was a going to, to, to pick Jenny and clear out of here and went ahead with plans for the young'un. Well, seeing as you're worried about getting your feet wet, I can't think of a better time for you to just mosey on. Oh, come on. Forget the past, Stumpy. I'm a telling you, I better get out of here. Damn, who's Kentucky? Wake up the luck. It's all right, Luck. I'm coming for you. The North Fork overflowed its banks that night, and the darkness rushed with the water blotting out everything. When morning came, Stumpy's cabin was gone. The pride, the joy, the hope, the luck of Roaring Camp was gone with it. Kentuck's missing, too. Oh, if we only could have got to him in time. Our luck's gone. I'm leaving, too. What's left? I think I'll head for Poker Flat. I hear it's high and dry there. We might as well all leave. Nothing left here for us anymore. Listen. Is that the... Luck. Do you think... Come on. Let's go see it. Look. I see his dress. It is the luck. He's alive. Hey, and, and two men. It's Stumpy. But... Kentucky's holding the bay. Quick, drag them out of the water before they're drowned. Come on, come on, let's go. Oh. Feeling better, Kentucky? Where, where, where am I? Not where you belong. That's for sure, you old goat. You're alive. And... Uh, the luck? <laughs> you saved him. You all people. But he saved us, partner. <laughs> By yelling bloody murder before we, we swallowed the whole of the North Fork. No. Yeah. <laughs> you believe in the luck now, Kentuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the hotel and, the, and females? Yeah, uh, <laughs> even them. <laughs> you hear that, luck? <laughs> Son, I reckon you got two godfathers now. <laughs> this is Sally Forrest again. Out at the studio the other day, while we were waiting to score a new picture, one of the musicians who was explaining the various keys, modes, and musical effects told me a little anecdote. It seems that a musician had made an early appointment with Brahms at the home of the master. He arrived there, was shown in by a servant, who explained that Brahms was still sleeping and that he did not wish to disturb him. After waiting a polite interval, during which Brahms did not appear, the visitor went to the piano and struck a single loud minor chord, like this. Now, anyone who has ever studied music knows that a minor key mirrors anxiety and tension, and that a minor chord suggests incompletion. It just begs for a satisfactory resolution. 
Although he was still asleep, Brahms heard the minor chord as it crashed into his subconscious and went ringing and ringing there. With an uneasy start, he awoke. Still no major chord. He hastily dressed, rushed downstairs, hastened to the piano and struck the major chord like this. Well, that little anecdote gave me a thought on prayer. Sometimes our whole uneasy lives are like minor chords, full of anxiety, tension, frustration. But through union with God, which we achieve through prayer, there never need be a sense of incompletion. The major resolving chord is a few simple, is a few simple words. O oh Lord, thy will be done. Family theater again reminds us, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Hollywood Family Theater has brought you transcribed Walter Brennan in The Luck of Roaring Camp. Sally Forrest was your hostess. Ralph Moody was heard as Ken Tuck. Others in our cast were Ted DeCorsia, Tom Holland, Len Beardsley, Marion Richmond, and Billy Bauckham. The radio adaptation of Bret Hart's classic was by Virginia M. Cook, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which responds to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Family Theater will present Jack Benny and Lucille Ball in The Golden Touch. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Thank you.